So you could prove this from scratch, um, but like I said, don't do it from scratch. Now that you know the theorem exists, the, the completeness axiom, when we've proven it, uh, you can get the infimum relatively quickly. You might, I guess you need to know something that, you kind of need to know how the negatives interact. No, you should still be fine. Yeah, yeah, you, you, you can prove this using the completeness axiom. So I would say suggest not doing it from scratch unless you want to practice, you know, doing your proofs with the, uh, the real numbers uh, and, you know, using Dydekin cuts and you want to practice that, then of course, go ahead and do it from scratch. Okay. Um, so this is a fairly simple statement. Uh, if you're non-empty bounded from above, then you have a supremum. So immediately we're going to just prove two really quick things from this. So one is, I don't remember what this is called, the Archimedean principle or something. But just as mathematicians, we use this all the time. Who cares? Uh, uh, how do I actually want to state this? Like there's no, yeah, how do I actually want to state? Uh, yeah, n is not bounded from above. I mean, this is not crazy, right? The naturals are not bounded from above. I think we all knew that. Right, and the proof is very simple, right? Uh, for the sake of contradiction, assume they are. Assume they are. In which case then they're non-empty and bounded from above. So by the completeness axiom, they have a supremum. So by the completeness axiom, they have a supremum. I guess I could just say sup n exists, i.e. sup n exists. OK, so in particular, what that means is that every natural number is less than sup n. is less than or equal to sup n. Now, why is this obviously a contradiction? Like, can we think of a natural number, uh, which is definitely bigger? Uh, let x be the supremum. We could create y equals x plus 1. Exactly, right. So if we take the supremum, we know that if I, you give me a natural number, if I add 1 to it, it's another natural number. And so if I take you know the largest, um, or basically, if the supremum Actually, do I want to do I want to worry about how how technical do I want to get here? Basically, there is. I'm just I'm just debating in my head whether I want to try and worry about whether the sup n is actually a natural number. But certainly, when you add one to it, you're going to get something uh, a natural number which is bigger. Let's for now. Let's just say you know convince yourself that sup n is a natural number. that sup n is in n, but then uh, sup n plus 1 is in n, uh, and is not bounded above by sup n. Bounded above by sup n, which is a contradiction. And again, this seems like a lot of things to write down for something that's obvious. But nonetheless, we're going to do it, right? We're going to be thorough and complete, make sure there's not a pun there. Uh, but we're going to be thorough. We're going to be complete. We're going to make sure that we actually believe all this is true. OK, so we can make our naturals uh, are as, as big as we like them to be. And then as immediate corollary, Maybe I'll let you prove this one. So for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists some, let's say capital N in N, such that one over N is less than epsilon. OK? If we wanted to show that sup n is an n, how would we do that? So you don't actually, 
this requires a little bit of closedness. Like my instinct is to do this topologically, but I don't think you have that ability. Um, basically argue that if soup n wasn't in n, then there's actually a gap here. Let me maybe draw a picture of this. So you know that let this be your real number line and here are kind of your natural numbers. I mean, part of this is kind of ridiculous already, right? And you care because like we're in a contradiction phase. We didn't know that the soup n doesn't exist. But anyway, so let's say here are the numbers, you know, maybe this is like eight, nine, 10, 11, or something like this. And I claim that this is the supremum, right? Not 11. The supremum is, the 11 is not the uh, supremum, but some number slightly bigger than 11 is. Well, then there's a gap here, right? And any of these numbers are upper bounds for the naturals that do better than the supremum, right? So you'd say something like, for the sake of contradiction, and now, and now we've kind of got a contradiction in a contradiction proof. But basically, if the supremum is not a natural number, then there's a gap between the supremum and the, and the biggest natural number, right? The biggest natural number. And if you take that distance, if you take the number, which is halfway between that, uh, which we know we can do, uh, even again by the completeness axiom, then that gives you an upper bound, which is lower than the least upper bound. And that's a contradiction as well. Does that make sense? Right, this has got to be the least upper bound. So if there's any gap between it and the next nearest thing, like you're going to be able to build a contradiction, right? So it definitely has to be in the naturals. Okay. And so this corollary is really how we're going to use this principle. And again, never state, I, I, again, I think the theorem is called the Archimedean principle, uh, but never state that. Nobody cares. Like, this is just how we uh, do things in math. You can say, yeah, obviously, you can choose an arbitrarily large natural number. Nobody's going to be upset that you didn't say, mention Archimedes' name. You know, we're not like name dropping here. And same thing for this corollary. This corollary is actually the way more useful thing, which is if you give me any positive number, I can find a natural number sufficiently big so that one over it is less than epsilon, right? So I can make the one over a natural number arbitrarily small. That's what this is saying, right? So this says, uh, so IE, we can make one over N arbitrarily small. We can't make it zero, but we can make it as small as we want. And this is a nice thing to start getting used to now, this, this, this language of saying, uh, how do I make something arbitrarily small or arbitrarily close to one another? Well, that has something to do with epsilon. So here we're going to say, listen, no matter what positive number epsilon you give me, I can make 1 over n smaller than that. That's me saying 1 over n can get as small as I want it to get. Uh, so that's mathematically how you actually phrase that. And this phrase is going to show up a lot when we start doing limits. Right, so I want you to try and get comfortable with why this is mathematically the best way of saying this right now. I'm going to leave the proof as an exercise for you. Because this is a corollary, you can probably guess that you're going to use the theorem, which is directly above it. So that is a very natural thing to do. I would also recommend doing this one by contradiction, right? Suppose for the sake of contradiction that all the natural numbers, 1 over n, are actually bigger than or equal to epsilon. And from that, you'll very quickly be able to derive uh, something which is nonsense. Okay, so it, it should only take a couple of lines. It shouldn't be anything intensive. Make sure you can do it uh, and give it a shot. Okay, but I'm not gonna let you do that now because there's other things that we wanna talk about. Uh, the next one, I'm gonna give you all a shot to prove this because this is, this is really, really important. Sometimes you can prove stuff about Suprema just by making an argument of, oh, it's the least upper bound. And that's a perfectly fine and reasonable way of proving some things. But sometimes you want a little bit, something a little bit more juicy, right? Something you can really sink your teeth into. So I'm going to give you a theorem here. We're going to prove this theorem. This is what it means. This is an equivalent statement to being a supremum and gives us a lot more tools to actually prove stuff. Okay. So suppose that S is a subset of R and M is an upper bound. for S. So implicitly, right, I've said that S is bounded from above because I've told you that it has an upper bound. 
uh, m is equal to the supremum of s if and only if for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists an element of the set such that m minus epsilon is less than s is less than or equal to m. Okay. And I claim that this is an, an intuitive statement. Okay. Before we actually prove it, though, let's draw a picture so that I can show you that, yes, this makes sense. So, again, let's kind of draw a number line. Uh, what have I been using for my number lines? Maybe blue. Okay. So, here's a number line, and maybe here's my set S right here. Okay. This is S. Okay. So, this is S. And if the supremum, so we know the supremum is going to hang out somewhere around here, right? That's the supremum of S. So what this theorem is saying is if you, if the supremum were to hold its, you know, arm out to the left a little bit, then it's going to end up grab, being able to grab something in S. Okay. That's what the statement is that if it holds its arm out to the left, maybe let me call this M instead of supremum M. m minus epsilon, uh, then there's some element inside of S. Okay, So the idea of being the least upper bound is that you're, you're snug against the set. right? So if I look at m minus epsilon, that's what I mean by kind of holding your arm out to the left. right? m is going to hold its arm out. If m holds its arm out, well, because it's right snug against the set, it must be able to grab something in S. right? If there's any gap between um, the, the candidate m and the set S, well, then there is actually a distance where it could hold its arm out and not grab at anything, right? Uh, yeah, it's the least upper bound, exactly, right? That's what the supremum means, it's the least upper bound. Okay, so this is what this theorem is saying. If you're the, you're the supremum, if and only if, no matter how far you reach to the left, you can always touch something in the set, right? Which really says that you're snug against the set. And you'll notice that there's this like, asymmetry in the inequalities here, right? We have M minus epsilon is less than, strictly less than S, is less than or equal to M. And this just takes care, like, can anyone think about the situation where that matters? Like why it, we have to put the less than or equal to M there? Like why not just less than M? What could go wrong? Sure, when M is in S, and then more importantly too, so I mean, the theorem still works here if M is in S, but what if, the, what if M is separated from the rest of S, right? What if M, uh, S is something like, zero, one union, the set three, right? That's not a three, three. So the supreme, exactly, it might be a point. So the supremum here is the number three, right? But now, when uh, the M reaches to the left, well, it's not going to grab anything in zero one, right? It's not, it's, it's too far away. It's actually, you know, got some distance between it and the closest thing to it, which is one. So we have to take into account the fact, well, if S is only has one element, then it is its own supremum. And again, this, this equal sign takes care of that, right? So basically what you're allowed to say is if, if you're in the set and you're an upper bound, you're automatically the least upper bound. Right, like this, this, this says that takes care of that. If you are an upper bound for your set and you're in the set, you get it for free. You're automatically at least upper bound because this definition is always satisfied because you can always take S to be equal to M, right? Uh, and so in the, in the case where S is a single element, that's okay, that's not an issue. But where this really like fixes things and takes care of it is if you start to be separated from the rest of the set as well, and your, your least upper bound is isolated by itself so that when it reaches over to the left, it can't grab anything else, but at least it can hug itself, All right? That's, it's going for hugs and it can't get anything and it grabs itself. Right, uh, so this is, I guess I should say S is not empty. You're right. So suppose that S in R is not empty. Actually, but this is a great question. So. What I want you to think about, first, I'm going to give you an opportunity to prove this. Okay, I'm going to give you like five minutes or so. And try and prove, uh, I, you probably won't get both directions, but if you can prove one direction in five minutes, I'll consider that an achievement. Um, but then if you finish early, what I want you to think about is, what are the upper bounds for the empty set? Does it have an upper bound? Is it bounded from above? And if so, what are its upper bounds? 
okay? So that'll kind of be a bonus thing to think about. But right now, choose a direction and try and prove it. I think they're both about the same difficulty. So just pick at random and see which one of these you can do. Okay, so I'm gonna give you five minutes, uh, see how far you can get. And if you get both directions, phenomenal. That'll make me really happy. Okay, so hopefully you managed to get at least one of these done. Uh, in my books, they're both contradiction proofs. And I don't know why that's true, uh, that like pretty much everything we've done so far today has been contradiction, um, but it is what it is. So let's see if we can make some crossroads into this. I think it's a result that when you look at it, first of all, you're probably like, oh man, how the hell am I gonna prove that? Uh, but it turns out not to be too bad. Uh, and if you didn't get it, it's okay. Hopefully once you see the proofs, you'll be like, oh yeah, okay, I, I, I could have done that. Uh, so let's take a look. So proof, so I'm gonna first prove this direction. So we're gonna assume that M is the supremum. Okay, and then for a sake of contradiction, I'm going to assume that the right-hand side is not true, right? So for a contradiction, contradiction, Suppose, so I'm going to negate the statement, right? So suppose there is some epsilon, you know, some epsilon greater than zero, such that for all S, uh, M minus epsilon is in fact greater than S, right? So the thing that's actually in the blue rectangle, you're not allowed to change that. That's universally true because one of the hypotheses, like one of the original statements of the question is that M is an upper bound. So the thing in the blue, you're not allowed to change, right? That is always true. M has to be an upper bound. But the thing that you're actually trying to prove is this thing here, which I'm gonna highlight in red. This is the thing that you're actually trying to prove, right? This is the significant bit. So in negating this, if I say, if this is not true, that means there exists some epsilon such that for every S, M minus epsilon is not less than S and being not less than is the same as being greater than or equal to. Why is this a contradiction? Like, why are we done? Uh, okay, so there are a couple of things here. So Mahmoud, you say because of the corollary, maybe, but you'll have to expand on that because M is already the soup. Yes, though you might have to expand on that. M minus epsilon must be an S2. It doesn't have to be just because there could be holes. So even if you right, just like I said, zero, one, union three, I could go over some epsilon and not have anything. Okay, since all elements in S are smaller than M, and right, so uh, yeah, exactly. So what have you guys struck on? That M minus epsilon is also an upper bound, right? Thus M minus epsilon is an upper bound, right? Look at this statement. This is, it's kind of like backwards than we normally write it, but we said every element of S is less than or equal to M minus epsilon. So it is an upper bound, and that's a contradiction because this is a contradiction because M is the least upper bound, exactly. And M minus epsilon is definitely smaller than M. M is the least upper bound, but M minus epsilon less than, strictly less than, M is a smaller upper bound. Right? So basically, if this theorem isn't true, what, and, and this is kind of more or less what I was saying, remember about that proof about the naturals, uh, if you're not snug, right, if you're not snug against the set, then there's some gap. And so I guess maybe this isn't exactly that, but basically what we're saying, like, listen, if I can go some distance epsilon over, 
and there are no elements of S there, then that means there's a gap between me and the set, right? So if I can move some distance over epsilon and there's no element of the set inside of there, well then this thing over here is also an upper bound and is actually smaller than the least upper bound, right? And that's a contradiction. You're not allowed to have that happen because we assume that M was the least upper bound to begin with, right? So that's our contradiction. Okay, any questions about that? That makes sense? You can see like there's, there, this was just mostly arguing. Like there was very kind of like, it was very little symbol manipulation, right? It was mostly just about making this argument that I was able to construct a smaller upper bound and that's, that's my contradiction. So the other one we're also gonna do by contradiction. So we're gonna assume that the property is true. So I just wanna say like, I am being a little bit, like normally when you write proofs, you shouldn't use the symbols, okay? But you know, I don't wanna write the whole thing out. I'm being lazy. But strictly speaking, in good form, when you're writing out a proof like this, you should write for all epsilon there exists an S, right? Don't, don't use the symbols uh, when you're actually writing proofs. Uh, there, so assume that this is true. And then for, a, for the sake of contradiction, assume that M is not the least upper bound. For a contradiction, assume M is not the least upper bound. Okay, so this is the dual argument of what I just said, right? So what I just said in the proof above, we said, look, if when I reach to the left, I can't grab any elements of S, then there must be a gap between me. Now I'm saying, well, now that there's a gap between me, that means that I'm actually not the least upper bound, right? Or now that I'm not the least upper bound, there's a gap between me. So we're going to use that gap as well. So what we're going to do is, so assume M is not the least upper bound, thus epsilon is equal to M minus the supremum is strictly positive, right? Because S is the least upper bound, it's smaller than every, all the other upper bounds. And so if M is not the least upper bound, it must be bigger than the supremum. So when I take M minus the supremum, I get something which is strictly positive, right? Again, it's this idea of this picture here. You know, you've got your tail end of S here. You've got your M and then you've got your soup S. And so we're saying, look, there's a gap here and this gap, that's gonna be epsilon, right? And hopefully you see where the contradiction is gonna come. Well, according to the property, if I go uh, to the at a distance of epsilon to the left of M, there's got to be some element of the supremum or sorry, some element of S inside of there. And clearly there isn't, right? By the picture I've drawn, there can't be any element of S inside of there. So that's going to be our contradiction. Okay, so thus there exists, exists an S in S such that, M minus epsilon. And if we work out what that is, so that's M minus M minus the supremum. And so everything cancels, so that just gives me the supremum. Okay, so I haven't actually used the uh, inequality yet, but I'm about to. Okay, so where I'm using this right now, but all I've done so far is just expand out what M minus epsilon is, right? So I haven't actually used the less than sign yet. So, and that has to be less than S, which is less than or equal to M. And here's my contradiction right here. So we found some element to the set, which was bigger than the supremum. And obviously that's not possible because the supremum is an upper bound, right? This is not possible since the soup supremum is an upper bound. And so we're done. Okay. So that's the proof there. And hopefully you see, like, let me kind of zoom out here so we can kind of see it in totality. There's a fair amount of writing here, right? Just because there should be anytime you do a proof. But if you look at the core essence of, of what each of these proofs is, you can see like there isn't actually much to it, right? 
Um, there's a core idea in each of these. That core idea is basically one line, and then the rest of the proof is just kind of writing all of that out. Okay, but are there any questions about this? Because this is this, like I said, this is actually a really useful tool for proving things about Suprema. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you could use. Um, well, it depends on what you mean, but like if I asked you to prove that something was a Suprema and you wanted to prove it by saying, oh, look, this is the least upper bound, that would be great. If you proved it using this epsilon approach, that would be fine as well. Uh, what you're often going to find is that you often need to mix them up. Like you can't, uh, sometimes you have to use them both. And in fact, let's do an example. Okay, so let me, uh, let me resume in here. And let's do an example where maybe there's a, a different way of doing it, but I don't necessarily know of one. But uh, here, I'm gonna we'll do an example where you have to do both. Okay, so let's say if A and B are sets, let's say subsets of R. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna define their sum in the way that you expect them to be, right? So we're gonna define A plus B, just like we did when we defined uh, the sums of Dedekind cuts. All right, so this is going to be the set of all x such that x is equal to a plus b, where a is an a, b is in b, right? So just take the set of all elements, which are the sum of something in a and the sum of something in b, or the sum of something in a and b, uh, show Okay, so the supremum of the sum is the sum of the supremum, right? Which is a pretty nice result. So I'm gonna ask you to prove this. And again, I'll give you like five minutes to do it. Uh, and I'm trying to decide whether I wanna give you a hint. No, I, I'm gonna let you struggle with this one and see, see where we go. Um, so like I said, I'm gonna give you five minutes with this. Uh, you're gonna to have to use my, my hint here. I will give you this hint. I think you're gonna to have to use both definitions. So you're gonna to wanna to use the fact that the Suprema is the least upper bound. And then you're also gonna to wanna to use the, uh, the, uh, the epsilon definition that we just did, okay? So I think using both are, are actually gonna be fairly critical. Uh, so give that a shot and we'll see where that goes. So five minutes. Okay, so hopefully you made some progress on that. Um, and if not, we'll see. Right. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do, and you are, of course, free to do this as well. I guess I should write solution because this is not a theorem. I don't want to write soup A and soup B everywhere. So I'm going to say let M A be the soup of A and M B be the soup of B. This is common to do when you're working with Suprema just because it's a pain in the butt to write soup everywhere, right? So if you want to give them a different name, totally call them M and N or something like that. So the first thing that I'm going to do is show that M A plus M B is an upper bound for A plus B. Okay, so first let's show that M A plus M B is an upper bound. For A plus B, okay? Uh, you let epsilon be soup B and vice versa. Could it work? Epsilon B, maybe it depends. I mean, write it up and we'll see. And then if you want, you can like email it to me or put it on Piazza or something. It, like if there's another proof, I'd love to see it. This is the, the one that I know or the one I came up with. Um, so, uh, all right. So first let's show that MA plus MB is an upper bound. This isn't too bad because if X is in A plus B, then we can write x equals a plus b, right? Where a is in a, b is in b. Haven't done anything crazy yet, just use definitions, right? Now we know that a is less than ma, right? Because ma is the supremum of a. So every, you know, it's an upper bound for everything in a. And b is less than mb for the same reason. Thus, x equals a plus b 
is less than MA plus MB. And because X was arbitrary, that shows that this is true for all the X, right? So MA plus MB is an upper bound. And so what this actually tells us is that the soup of AB, A plus B, is less than or equal to the soup of A plus the soup of B, right? Now let's think about why that's true. Again, you might have to think about that. Soup A plus soup B, that's MA plus MB, right? I just showed that this thing is an upper bound for A plus B. And since supremum of A plus B is the least upper bound of A plus B, we're guaranteed that it's automatically less than or equal to the thing on the right, right? So if we show that it's an upper bound, we get it uh, and we're done. Now, alternatively, I could try and show uh, A should be less than, yeah, you're right, sure. Let me make that less than or equal to. You'll learn very quickly that in this class, I'm very sloppy about my less than or equal to's, but you're absolutely right. That should be less than or equal to. Now, I would not recommend trying to show the opposite inequality. That, of course, is a very natural approach when you're trying to show uh, uh, equality, right? Show uh, A is less than or equal to B, and then B is less than or equal to A, and then you'll get that they're equal. On the other hand, now that I've shown that soup A plus soup B is uh, an upper bound, I can use the epsilon thing above uh, to actually show that soup A plus B, or to show that this is, in fact, the supremum, right? That M A plus M B is in fact the supremo. So now we want to show that MA plus MB is the supremum, not just an upper bound, but is the least upper bound. Okay, so to do this, <clears throat> we're going to use that result above. So let epsilon greater than zero be given. Okay, and again, let me write it out so you can see what's going to happen. So we want to show, or we want to find some uh, x in A plus B such that M A plus M B minus epsilon is less than x is less than or equal to m a plus m b, right? And again, don't hesitate to write that out it, if, you know, when you're trying to remember what you're doing. But this isn't quite the, the same theorem as above, right? Because there's this m a plus m b. You definitely want to write it down so that you gathered all of your knowledge into the page in front of you, right? So you can be like, OK, this is what I'm trying to prove. And I still really haven't you know, used anything, well, I, I've used the fact that uh, the supremum of A is an upper bound for A and the supremum of B is an upper bound for B, but I haven't used the fact that they're the least upper bound, right? So let's use that now. Basically, what I'm going to say is there exists, so since, or by definition, let's say, so by definition, there exists a in A and B in B such that M sub A minus epsilon over two is less than A, is less than or equal to M sub A, right? That's what it means for M sub A to be the supremum of A, right? Is for any epsilon, I can find an A which does this. I'm gonna choose epsilon over two here just so that things work out. If you used epsilon, it wouldn't be the end of the world. And we're going to do the same thing with B, less than or equal to MB, like so. OK, and then I'm going to add these. And that's going to give me exactly what I want. So we're going to get MA plus MB. You'll see now why I used epsilon over 2, because when I add these, I'm just going to get minus epsilon. It's less than A plus B, less than M sub A plus M sub B. So taking x equals a plus b in a plus b gives the result. 
right? And we're done. Voila. Okay. Yeah, I like that one, right? That, that works out really, really nice. And this thing where like, anytime you're trying to show things about the sums, uh, so you kind of like use this, this, this thing right here, this is a pretty common argument, okay? Why epsilon over two? It's so that when I add them, I get negative epsilon over two minus epsilon over two equals negative epsilon. So that's how this thing shows up by adding these two things, right? So the epsilon over two is just to keep things pretty, but like because the theorem holds for all epsilon, if you had done minus epsilon minus epsilon in the MA, so MA minus epsilon, MB minus epsilon, you'd have gotten MA plus MB minus two epsilon. And, and the reality is that's fine as well. Uh, but I'm someone who's kind of anal about making sure I get exactly epsilon at the end, but it doesn't matter. If you had two epsilon, it would have been okay. Yeah. Okay. So there's one last thing I want to do really, really quickly because I want to kind of start limits next week. Um, so I won't give you a chance to try and prove this yourself, but I just, I need to say this because I need to know, I need you to know what this word means. So definition, a set S in R is said to be dense if for every open interval a b then s intersected with a b is not empty okay and so some way of, uh, another way of saying this is a set is dense if every open interval contains an element of S, okay? And dense then kind of means what it means in English, which is to say it's everywhere, right? Like it, it, uh, uh, it well, I guess that's not what dense means in English. Dense in English means, you know, it's kind of like really quite thick. Why open interval? Just that's the definition we take. You could take a closed interval as well, except some people think that singletons can be closed intervals. And if you let a singleton be a closed interval, then this would be bad because I could do something where I definitely avoid the set S. So open intervals guarantee that there actually has to be some breadth in your interval and you can't just have a single point. Uh, but you know, if you kind of throw that out, and, and don't let singletons be closed intervals, then you could restate this with closed intervals, no problem, right? Uh, but that's just, there's a technical reason why we use open intervals. So the theorem that we need, uh, which uh, hopefully I don't run too long, is that the rationals are dense. Is AB a subset of S? No, AB is just any open interval. So here, let's think about what this means in the context of the theorem that I've just written. I'm saying that every open interval in R contains a rational number, right? That's what, that's what this is saying. And again, maybe this theorem is in somehow intuitive to you, but it's actually not easy to prove. But I'm saying every open uh, interval in the real numbers contains a rational number inside of it. Right. And this, you know, this fact is crazy. This actually leads to a lot of interesting mathematics, or you could say like hard mathematics. The fact that the reals have a countable, right? Because Q is countable. The fact that it has a countable dense subset means you can do a lot of crazy things. Okay. So here's the intuition of the proof here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say let AB be an open interval. Now you all probably suspect, yeah, I can find a rational number in there, but how am I actually going to go about doing that? That's a little bit tricky. And so the intuition that we're going to use here is let's say again, let's say here's my real number line, right? Here's R and here is my interval AB. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make a, a fine tooth comb, okay? And I'm going to denote that in red here. Uh, and I'm going to make sure that when I take this fine tooth comb, one of the tines end up in the interval A, B, and I'll show you what I mean by that. So let's say maybe two actually show it up, that's fine. What I'm gonna do is I wanna choose N sufficiently small or N sufficiently big so that the distance between adjacent uh, rational numbers 
uh, is going to be one over n. Like obviously there are a bunch of rational numbers in that interval, that doesn't matter. What I'm gonna do is say, let's take a subset of the rational numbers whose distances are all one over uh, n apart. And I wanna choose n sufficiently big to guarantee that no matter what I do, one of these tines is in the interval a, b. And that's how I'm going to guarantee that there's a rational number inside of there. And of course there are actually infinitely many, but I only just need to prove that there's one, right? So that's what I'm gonna do, is I'm gonna do this. The way that I'm gonna do this is choose n in n such that one over n is less than b minus a, right? Because that's what this distance is here, right? This distance, how big is the interval? It's b minus a wide. So if I choose one over n to be less than that interval, I'm guaranteed that as I kind of walk these, uh, you know, kind of mark off one over n rational numbers, that I'm eventually going to get something which lives inside of this interval. Okay. I know I'm running a little bit long here, but define b to now be the set of m over n, where m is in z. Okay. So this set is now me just literally just saying, okay, I'm going to take one over capital N, two over capital N, three over capital N, four over capital N. And so this is just me making those red marks, right? This is my comb. I'm just going to walk down the line and mark off one over N every time I walk down. And the claim is that B intersect, uh, that this intersected with the interval has, is not empty. And that then we'd be done. for which we claim that B intersect AB is not empty uh, and we'd be done, right? So for the sake of contradiction, assume that it is empty. Um, so for a contradiction, assume B intersect AB is in fact empty. Okay, let M, uh, yeah, let's let capital M 